Jaz sem Gregor Moder, z mano je pa Robert Faller, avtor knjige Interpasivnost, ki je letos izšla pri založbi Maska, ki seveda tudi organizira ta dogodek. Samo ta uvod bom povedal po slovensko, potem pa po angliščini. Robert se potpisa dejansko že uči nekaj malega slovenščine, tako da ga bom... Tako da ga bom po tem pogovoru dejansko malo zaslišal, če je kaj razumel. Hotel sem povedati, da je Robert Večkrat je že bil gost tukaj v Ljubljani, zelo veliko ljudi ga ima zelo včislih. Sem pa res tudi ponosen, da je zdaj končno šla njegova knjiga o interpasivnosti, ker to je njegov ključni koncept. Koncept, v katerem slabo Žižek pravi, da gre za enega od teh konceptov, ki na nek način sodijo v rang Maxa Webera. Robert, I will now switch to English. So, so that you'll be better able to check. Very welcome. Uh, my, uh, my, my German, <laughs> that you'll be able to check my German mm -hmm. better. So, Robert is the author of some fantastic books. Uh, the first one, I think, is on Altiser das Schweigen im Text. It's a really proper, uh, de um, uh, very detailed philosophical uh, book on, on Altiser. Uh, his next two books, Illusionen der Anderen, über das Lustprinzip in der Kultur, uh, Illusie drugih o uh, Principu ugodja al pa užitka v kulturi, ter uh, Šmucige heilige und die reine Vernunft, uh, umazano sveto in čisti um, sta v Slovenščini šle pri založbi na lekta, uh, kot umazano sveto in čisti um, tudi to knjigo si danes mimo grede lahko uh, kupite po znižani ceni uh, tam na zunaj. Sicer, uh, oh, sorry, I, I, I said I will switch to English, sorry. Well, for the titles, it's yes, fine. Yes, well, yes, the, the English titles, which are actually German, sorry about that. Uh, I wanted to mention that um, the American Board of uh, Professional Psychology uh, awarded, uh, uh, awarded uh, Robert's book on Illusion und der Anderen for the, well, for the English translation, which came later, I think, than the Slovenian translation, which you know, right. is another impression of how mm -hmm. important actually mm -hmm. this, this content <laughs> is. Um, the next books, which should, of course, also appear in Slovenian uh, sooner rather than later, are Vofure sich zu leben lohnt, čemu se splača živeti, and Erwachsenensprache, über ihr verschwinden aus Politik und Kultur, govorica odraslih o njenem izginotju iz politike in kulture. So this is just the overview of the many works that you have written, which are, I have written, I have read most of them, and I have to say that these are really fantastic philosophical works. Otherwise, I will just say, you know, just one more thing about the introduction, which is that Robert is a professor at uh, uh, Art University in Linz, uh, and uh, that he's a, well, of course, a, a great philosopher of art, culture, and everyday life. Um, and uh, let, sh please join me in giving a warm welcome. <laughs> we'll <not have> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much, Gregor, for your kind introduction as well as for all the efforts you have taken for this book. Um, in the beginning, I also want to express a general gratefulness because uh, it is almost 30 years that I have now been coming to Ljubljana to lecture. First time happened almost 30 years ago due to the generous invitation by Mladen Dola and Slavoj Žižek. I was still a young student of philosophy at the time. And since then I have been coming back uh, many times and I have always encountered here a very well read, very well informed, critical, interested, friendly community uh, that from whom I learned a lot, that inspired me a lot and that somehow precisely by its expectation uh, somehow made me able to produce something that I could show here. So as uh, Don Quixote once says to Sancho Panza, we only become able to behave like true knights because there are some princesses out there that expect <laughs> us to be <laughs> beautiful and brave. <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, despite the fact that I know that many of you are already very familiar with my work, I start, uh, maybe just for the sake of humor, from scratch and start with the most basic questions and it will get a bit better than very soon as you will see. So what is interpassivity? Interpassivity is a behavior that can be observed in many cases and that you may have already encountered either in your own behavior or in that of friends or other people that you can observe. It happens, for example, when somebody buys a book in a bookshop and comes home happily with the book and puts the book immediately to the bookshelf and then doesn't touch the book anymore for years or maybe for an eternity. And uh, so uh, a satisfaction arises immediately precisely from that little action and it is as if the bookshelf would read the book in place of the reader. This has already to a certain extent been remarked by um, Flaubert in his small novel Bibliomania. There he exactly says that Bibliomania doesn't mean that you want to read the books. <laughs> Uh, the same you can experience often when you work on a computer, you find an interesting text on the internet and you immediately print it out. And then you <laughs> put the, the print into some uh, drawer and never watch it again. But already this act of printing somehow relieves you from a certain tension and you feel better. Or um, if you don't want to waste paper, you download this text and download it onto your hard drive. And again, it is as if the hard drive would read it uh, in your place. So what happens here actually is that a certain pleasure, you buy the book uh, or you download the text in order to consume it, to read it. And this pleasure of reading, this consumption uh, is replaced by a different, smaller act that often in a little bit resembles the original act. So sometimes it looks a bit as if reading would happen. You can observe that very often uh, when uh, you photocopy the text. You find a book in a library, very interesting, maybe just one chapter, and you go to the photocopying machine and you photocopy the chapter. And then, of course, you take the copies into your pocket and forget about them and whatever. <laughs> But uh, photocopying means that you put it on a glass plate and then some kind of light of attention is shed on the page in a linear way. And then you shift the pages and then again some light of attention comes. And uh, so it is something that in the most literal way resembles reading. And so we could say the act of reading is replaced by a smaller act that in a symbolic way uh, symbolizes the act of reading. Or to say it in an abstract formula, the real act of reading is replaced by a symbolic act. Um, second question, where does the name of interpassivity come from? This stems from my engagement, as Gregor has mentioned, at an art university. I've been working since 1993 as a philosopher at several art universities, especially in the beginning. I worked in Linz. As you may know, Linz is a kind of stronghold of electronic art at the time, especially with Peter Weibel and the Ars Electronica. Uh, there was a very prominent discourse around especially the electronic media, but spreading out into all visual arts at the time of interactivity. And from the very beginning, I was very skeptical about this discourse on interactivity because I think it contained two very questionable assumptions. In the first place, that interactivity or the spectators, observers being involved into the creation of the artwork would provide them with increased pleasure. 
And secondly, that involving the spectators would also uh, bring a kind of emancipation to them. So they would not be just passive observers that would somehow be flooded with some artistic design. No, they could design themselves and that would politically free them and, and fill them with pleasure. Uh, <coughs> I was very skeptical about this basic assumption that uh, observers, if they are not involved in the creation of the artwork, would just passively consume. That was the, the, the formula that was given by this people of interactivity discourse. And I think this entirely neglected uh, the whole work of reading an artwork against its intentions of critically observing and so on, uh, compared to the often very silly tasks of involvement. So this idea with interactivity, everybody becomes an artist, uh, was to my experience very silly, because in many electronic devices, you were just riding a bicycle and you could turn left or right but this had nothing to do with you becoming an artist. <laughs> so uh, there were many reasons to, to doubt this uh, notion of interactivity. And uh, as it was predictable, it disappeared from the scene very soon. A few years ago, later, everybody all of a sudden was ashamed to talk about <laughs> it again. <laughs> but uh, uh, it was replaced by similarly stupid discourses like uh, participation, for example, which is still to a certain extent extent widespread in some kind of political art. Now, the name of interpassivity was uh, coined in order to like counterbalance this uh, predominance of interactivity discourse, which I felt to be a sort of burden on the artistic production of my students, because students were sometimes doing pretty nice space installations, but they would come to me and say, Robert, have you seen it? Uh, do you think I should make it somehow interactive? And so uh, by some reason, they felt it would be better if, if uh, observers could change it. So, and I think uh, this, uh, in a way, um, did not help the artist to produce better art. So I uh, suggested them a little thought experiment. And I said, uh, what happens? Uh, if there is no, in, no interactivity? Or can you tell me, is there an opposite to interactivity? And they said, well, the opposite is if there is no interactivity, if you just passively consume the artwork which is already accomplished. <laughs> but uh, of course, as you may know from Immanuel Kant and his ideas about negative measure, uh, no interactivity is not the opposite of interactivity. Just as no money is not the opposite of money, but uh, no, the opposite of money is if you have debt. Huh? So there is a kind of negative money sometimes. And uh, maybe there's also some kind of negative interactivity. So the theoretical idea was in the classical artwork is something that is ready, accomplished, and the observers can allegedly just passively consume. Interactive art means that the artwork would be somehow open, contain some holes, and delegate some activity on to the observers. Interactivity. But the opposite would be the opposite transfer, so that not only activity would not be transferred on the observers, but so-called passivity would be transferred back on the artwork. So the artwork would contain the so-called passivity of observation, and it would be ready, not only accomplished, but already observed. So the artwork would signal the observers, you can go home, I have seen myself, uh, I'm fine. <laughs> In the beginning, it was a kind of theoretical spec speculation just created in order to liberate the spirits a little bit from this obsession. But at that moment, I think Gregor has mentioned it, uh, an example given by Slavoj Žižek uh, gave us a tremendous help. Slavoj Žižek had developed in a very different context of psychoanalytic theory this idea uh, interpreting Lacan's sentence, the unconscious is outside. He had developed this idea that our allegedly innermost feelings like uh, amusement or grief or religious belief can exist outside ourselves. This is somehow 
uh, testifying to Lacan's idea that psychoanalysis is not a science of depth, of hidden uh, depths, but to the contrary, a science, is a science that is concerned with the surface, something that uh, is hidden precisely because it's so visible, because it's so, so much on the surface. So, Slavoj Žižek said, uh, my laughter, for example, my amusement can very well exist outside. Uh, when I come home, Slavoj Žižek wrote in the Sublime Object of Ideology, when I come home from a hard day, I, I switch on the television and there is a sitcom going on, you know, these comedies where you have already this wonderful canned laughter. They make jokes and, and funny scenes and then you hear a certain laughter. And Zizek wrote, I'm too tired to follow what they say and what they do. No, no problem, I just let them laugh and after half an hour where I haven't understood the word, uh, I, I feel as objectively amused. <laughs> <laughs> So this was the perfect proof example for, for my speculation at the time. It proved there could be artworks that contained already their own observation and it proved that some observers wanted it exactly to be like that. Even if Slavoj Žižek was the only one in the world, it proved that there were existing such observers who did not want to be involved interactively <laughs> and who also did not want to just passively watch. They, they wanted their passivity to be already accomplished by the artwork. The artwork should observe itself. <coughs> But I think this discovery would not have been possible just from the side of philosophy or psychoanalysis if it had not had a strong support in the arts of the time. The older folks among you may remember how a certain kind of low-tech art looked in the 1990s. Um, artists like Rikrik Tiravanija and uh, Filip Pareno, for example, had invented what was called service art at the time. So at many uh, art venues at the time, uh, it looked a bit like in a post office, not like in Nova Posta, but uh, in a classical post office. Yeah? You, you, you entered the art space and, and several artists were sitting behind desks with forms in front of them. And you would have to sit down uh, opposite of them and take one of the forms and fill it in. And the artist, uh, due to that form, would do some service to you. Okay. Until that, nothing special. But if you looked more closely, what kinds of services they offered, uh, the thing became interesting and paradoxical. Because some artists, for example, like Viennese artist Ruth Kasera at the time, offered a service that she would attend a meeting at the coffee shop, for example, that would have the next day, or a meeting at the bar, you would mention it. So let's assume you would have a meeting tomorrow at Petit Café in Ljubljana. Uh, the, the artist would uh, go there in your place, and if you filled in uh, whom you, she would meet there, you could fill in a certain person, a certain name. You could also decide how the artist should talk to that person formally or more friendly or uh, as a loving person or whatever, uh, how long it should be, how much it sh she should talk uh, about what she should speak. You could all decide uh, all these things. But uh, of course, at the time, most artists uh, themselves were uh, tempted to describe this kind of art as interactive active art, because of course if you didn't fill in these forms, nothing would have happened. But if you look closely what was at stake in this art, uh, that was a pretty uncanny and troubling question or problem, because what was at stake was the question, would you maybe not prefer your enjoyment to be done by somebody else. It was not work that could be delegated. It's not that the artist offered you to clean your windows. You could have that from other artists as well. <laughs> Gelatine would come naked and clean your windows. That's a different kind of service. But <laughs> But with Ruth Kasera or Astrid Benzer, who offered you to write postcards to your friends, similar, uh, it was precisely uh, what people would do for their enjoyment. They would hire cleaning people to clean their windows and go to some bars and meet friends or write postcards to their loving, uh, uh, beloved people. But here, 
Ruth Kaserer and Astrid Benzer and other artists posed the question, is it not possible that you maybe secretly would prefer me to attend your meeting at the bar so that you can meanwhile stay at home and clean your windows? <laughs> so some people might prefer uh, to uh, work than to enjoy. So this was the interesting question that was raised in this art. And uh, it was a question about a certain problem with enjoyment and pleasure. And I think uh, it was an interesting criticism of a kind of general economic assumption that you would find in utilitarianism or in the economies of the common homo economicus, the economic man, uh, the basic assumption that seems so self-evident that we always try to minimize work and that we always try to maximize pleasure. In this case, it was the opposite. People were a bit reluctant to have their pleasures and they were more keen to do work instead. So they were uh, not spontaneous hedonists. Mankind apparently has a problem with enjoyment and they are not so uh, easy to seduce to enjoy. They rather tend to avoid their pleasure but not avoid it completely. Instead they would replace it by small acts of replacement. Ersatzhandlungen as Sigmund Freud calls these replacement acts that are often also compulsive. <coughs> So in the first place people did not want to enjoy and in the second place they wanted very much somebody else to enjoy in their place. Otherwise they could not deal with this avoidance. <clears throat> so I think here you can also see what at the time uh, I felt uh, to be the task of philosophy at an art university. And I think this brings in a certain uh, contemporary actuality to the question. Uh, the problem here was that artists had produced a very interesting idea of problems with enjoyment. But this interesting idea was totally concealed by the contemporary art discourse or even by the theories that the artists themselves announced. So what they had discovered was actually interpassivity, but they concealed it under a kind of fashionable discourse of uh, interactivity. And this is something that does not only happen in the arts. Uh, this is what Gaston Bachelard and Louis Althusser have discovered in the history of sciences. Uh, Bachelard already looking at natural sciences, physics, chemistry, mathematics, uh, discovered that very often scientists develop a certain philosophy in their scientific work, but they find themselves unable to explain that philosophy. And so when they become explicit, when you ask them what is your philosophy, they, uh, they explain a very stupid philosophy that is not uh, at the level of what they actually practice. So um, Louis Althusser put this into the formula, there is a philosoph philosophy in a practical state at work in the science and often this clever philosophy in a practical state gets concealed by an explicit, spontaneous philosophy of the scientists. And this explicit, spontaneous philosophy, as Althusser explained with a word by Karl Marx, is often articulated in a borrowed language, in the borrowed language of an already existing philosophy. And I think the same happens in the arts. So you have a certain philosophy in a practical state, but it gets concealed by the explicit philosophy of the artists. And this has always been my understanding of philosophy, um, that it is exactly this gap where philosophy has to intervene. Philosophy is not a set of knowledge by which you can uh, make people smarter when you teach uh, this precious knowledge to them. Philosophy does not have an object, as Althusser said, uh, but philosophy becomes precisely uh, necessary when people themselves have started producing a philosophy that makes them blind for what they are actually doing. So um, 
I think if there's one principle of philosophy, especially at, at art universities, but also at in universities of the sciences, this principle can be put into the word, look if your own new ideas that you have already produced are not smarter than the old ideas that you now tend to express in a borrowed language, in the language of an already existing philosophy. Of course, as you may know, in the arts, this problem is much uh, more predominant th even than in the sciences, because it is not the artists themselves that often comment in a kind of misleading way about uh, their uh, achievements, but artists are regularly and structurally compelled to explain what they do and to explain it in the language of curators and critics. So artists are surrounded by a set of prompters that suggest them a certain language. Is it not interactive? Yes, sir, it's interactive. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, they have to use this language for many purposes, also because art produces uh, uh, items of distinction and this language, this fashionable language that somehow should give a certain symbolic value to this production uh, is supposed in the first place to give uh, the marks of distinction. So a certain fashionable philosophy makes the product appear more valuable. So they are very uh, compelled to, to do that. But Unfortunately, very often that makes them miss the best point in their own work. And at that point, the philosophy they produce or the philosophy they articulate and utter uh, backfires upon their own artistic production. Because if it's a philosophy that misrecognizes the best aspect of, of the work that they have already done, uh, this philosophy is not only a description, but it becomes the norm for the ongoing production. And so the next artwork that they produce will be significantly weaker. It will precisely lack the dimension that the philosophy uh, neglected or that this philosophy was blind against. So I think we encounter here the funny aspect of a certain knowledge that makes people less smart. This borrowed language of existing philosophy uh, does not help people to become more witty and, and smarter, but to the contrary, it makes them a bit stupid uh, in the sense that they uh, become blind against their own smartness that they already had uh, produced. Uh, and I think this is uh, today very often the case, as you may know, in the art field now, uh, also due to institutional changes and to the in introduction of research research programs, artists are now uh, compelled to explain what they do in terms of so-called artistic research. And I think this is a huge field where spontaneous philosophies predominate and make the artists blind against uh, the wit of their own production. And one of the misunderstandings, for example, here is that artistic research is often understood in the sense artists do scientific research. So if the artists uh, show bibliographies, what they have read and what they have studied, you say, OK, you have done scientific research. This, this is artistic research because you're an artist, right? <laughs> but uh, but uh, this is as stupid as if a dentist who plays cello would produce dentistic music. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? It, it, the, the character of a certain practice, epistemologically, does not depend on who you are, but it does depend on what methods you apply and what methods lead you to the specificity the specificity of your results. That makes artistic research artistic if in the end something comes out that is art. And to explain the difference very briefly, I had a chance to observe this uh, three years ago when I had a funny engagement in a small theater in Vienna and uh, they had asked me to do a kind of philosophy show. And the show went on like this, that I was a kind of silly uh, showmaster and uh, a bit crazy and I could imagine that uh, uh, prominent philosophers would be my show guests. And for the first show I had invited Karl Marx and I could, in, uh, could ask Karl Marx everything that I always wanted to know from him. And uh, so developing this 
piece meant in the first place, of course, to study Marx theory again carefully and look what parts should be chosen and, and how, how does the theory of surplus value actually work. That was scientific research. But in the second place, we always had to ask ourselves, and how does that work on stage? How do we make a scene out of it? How can actors move so that spectators can see something interesting on stage? And that was a completely different question. And here, uh, here started artistic research in order to transform this into a piece that could be swallowed by observers uh, in a theater. So I come back to uh, what I think is one of the important philosophical aspects or also political aspects that are involved in interpassivity theory. It is precisely the point that the artists somehow opened up about pleasure. Why are people not hedonists? And why, secondly, why are people at certain epochs even less hedonist than at others? So we also have to historicize the question to a certain extent. The answer to the first question, why are people not hedonists, I, I think is best given by Sigmund Freud in his essay on the uncanny. Because there Freud describes that a certain surplus of pleasure, a certain surplus of la luck, often appears uncanny and unbearable to us. He quotes a German poet Friedrich Schiller in this poem about the ring of Polycrates. He, Polycrates is a tyrant somewhere in the Adriatic, Adriatic Sea and uh, in the Mediterranean. And some guest comes and nothing goes wrong for this uh, tyrant. He's always lucky. And when he throws his ring into the sea, the next day a fish is caught and in the stomach of the fish, the ring is again. So nothing gets lost. And, and then the, the guest uh, is totally shocked and, 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 and uh, escapes from there with, with, with awe. And so we could say uh, human pleasure, uh, adult human pleasure, uh, circulates around a certain uh, impossibility. There is a kind of fulfillment or an appearance of fulfillment, at least, that is hard to bear. And all aesthetic problems, I think, stem precisely from this. Not only the problem with the uncanny, but uh, I would claim also the joy of comedy uh, stems from dealing with this impossibility. Now, the second question, I think, is even more interesting here, because uh, obviously not all historical periods have the same uh, access to pleasure and not all have the same problem with pleasure to the same extent. And I think most of us are witnesses of such a fundamental change in culture, because I think uh, it is not exaggerated to say that in the last 20 years we had to observe that many pleasures that before we found okay and, and bearable and, and funny and pleasant have somehow taken on a kind of sinister color. Whatever was a pleasure 30 years ago, like driving cars, wearing high heel shoes, wearing furs, uh, joking, flirting, eating fat meat, uh, uh, sex, uh, or even uh, putting a child that had fallen down back on, on its feet. Uh, so, uh, simple pleasures uh, all of a sudden, by many reasons, became uh, somehow suspect. And, and by ecological reasons, political reasons, health reasons, smoking, for example. So many things uh, all of a sudden became sinister. So we could say that the time that we live in uh, is a time marked by the fact that our pleasures have become suspect to us. I have uh, written about this in the book that Gregor has mentioned, uh, Umasa no Sveto in Cisti Un, and also <laughs> 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 Ha, ha, ha.
um, and I have also uh, written it in a book that some of you may be able to read, uh, and I am even less able to pronounce its title in Croatian, Sašto se ispleti šivetni. So I think you know what I mean, what, what life is worth living for, that's the title of this book that has now recently appeared uh, in Croatian. Um, so uh, I think what can be said about our times, our postmodern neoliberal times, is that pleasure has become a problem to an unexpected extent. And so people have become unable to make what Bertolt Brecht has described as one of the basic materialist claims. Uh, they have become unable to say, first comes food and then come morals. This is not possible for many people in Western societies, at least anymore. If you think of American societies, many people are only to buy fancy sports shoes if they are assured that another shoe will go to a child in Africa. No matter if that child really needs a sports shoe. But uh, uh, you, get, uh, you don't get just shoes for yourself. No, uh, another shoe goes to Africa. Uh, or People are not able to just buy fancy fashion clothes. They have to be assured that it's also ethical fashion, that no children have been exploited, only adults have been exploited. <laughs> <laughs> and, but very often, also, this, this assurance is all of a sudden replaced by another assurance. It's not any more ethical. We don't know. Maybe children made it, but it's sustainable. So at least the environment is not harmed. So, <coughs> so um, I think this is philosophically very interesting. Why are people all of a sudden not any more able to say, oh, I bought fa fancy clothes, which I like, which I find fashionable. Uh, and why is fashion not just fashion for these elites? I think one could maybe say um, that uh, they, ha they have a certain need for a certain injunction. They, they need a certain duty in order to allow themselves for a certain pleasure. Well, my duty is to be sustainable or ethical. Uh, and then I can have some pleasure, maybe, if there remains any pleasure with that. But I think this, in a way, copies a, a, a cultural process that can work better uh, that actually involves such an injunction. Because that is actually how in culture we deal with pleasures that are not all the time benign or with pleasures that have a certain ambivalence to them. And if we are honest, we probably have to admit that everything that we find somehow pleasant or great at some moments is in its very nature ambivalent. So the best pleasures we can have are never pleasures that we can have all the time and that we find good all the time. So smoking can be maybe fine at some moments, but uh, all the smokers somehow hate themselves for their smoking and or hate other smokers for their smoking. And, um, uh, and drinking wine can be wonderful, but at some moments we have headache and we hate ourselves uh, for what we did in the evening before. And, 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 so, so, and even very innocent pleasures, like if, if we go for a walk, uh, it means that we have to be ready to waste time. We, we cannot look at our clocks and say, I, I go for a walk for seven minutes and I'll be back in seven minutes sharp. So uh, even that requires a certain uh, transgression of our normal economy uh, uh, in our treatment of time. So uh, I think the interesting point that we encounter here is that all the pleasures that make life worth living for are by their very nature ambivalent and only due to their nature they make life worth living for. But it, something is additionally required in order to transform them from repelling pleasures or from repelling things, matters, into attractive matters. So something that is by itself an ambivalent substance becomes <laughs> sublime, wonderful, fascinating at the very moment that a kind of cultural injunction is at work. 
So when I work in the evenings and I study difficult texts and all of a sudden some friends come by and ring at my door and saying, Robert, uh, you have worked enough today, you go for a beer with us, we have to celebrate something. Uh, then maybe I let myself be seduced and go with them and then the beer in my hand becomes absolutely sublime and wonderful and the proof that life is worth living for. And so due to that injunction and that I feel it's a duty now, uh, I can celebrate it and due to celebration it becomes wonderful. So what we observe here is a transformation <laughs> of a substance that at first sight may have appeared filthy and ambivalent into a substance that appears sublime. And that of course is also what Sigmund Freud has remarked, if you remember, he's uh, dealing with the notion of taboo when he says taboo, funnily, but interestingly, uh, says in the first place sublime and in the second place filthy. So there are matters that somehow have these two sides to them. They, in some aspect they are uh, filthy and in some aspect they are sublime. And I think what allows us to transform them and to shift them from their filthy side into their sublime side is precisely a kind of uh, social imperative that now we celebrate, now this has to be done. When a colleague at work has birthday, we say, okay, now we put the champagne on the tables and now we drink and even you, even if the doctor has told you you must not have alcohol, even you drink a little bit with us for celebrating our dear colleague's birthday. So. Um, this injunction allows people to transform and in a way this also makes this moment a special moment because what people celebrate is precisely their ability to collectively transform the nature of this very substance that they are dealing with. So this is the reason why you cannot celebrate an adult person's birthday with mineral water or with something. It, it only works if you, if you use an ambivalent substance because only then you have a chance to transform it into something sublime. And I think if there is a precise theoretical meaning to the notion of sublimation in Freud's theory, it is precisely this. Sublimation is what allows us to transform ambivalent matters into sublime matters. As you may remember, Freud once has a wonderful point about the difference between the an ancient world and our modern world. Um, in a footnote to the three essays on sexuality, Freud says, the ancient people celebrated the drive whereas we find it necessary to excuse the drive by the advantages of its object. It's very filthy, but the object is so great, so okay. Uh, but the ancient people, he says, celebrated the drive. And I think the key to this remark is the notion of celebration. Celebration is nothing that we do when we want it. Celebration is something that we do when we feel we must do it. So if the occasion says, okay, this is now a birthday, or this is now a situation where sex should happen, then we have to celebrate and then we do it. It's not that we do it when we feel like it. <laughs> Celebration is a kind of social duty, and only this social duty allows people to uh, transform ambivalent ma matters into great matters. And I think to conclude this uh, with a certain perspective, uh, I would also point at the difference between the ancient world and our world today. Um, this is a point that I have made in my last German book, Erwachsenensprache, and again, Slovenia is the first place where a translation will appear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, in, in Problemi, this small chapter will uh, soon be published here. Uh, it's a, a speculation about gods. Because it, when you look at the history of religions, of course, not all religions do have gods, but if religions have God, uh, I think one uh, interesting feature can be seen. The older a religion, the more it is probable that it also has got young gods or children gods. 
the younger a religion is in its history, the more it's probably that it has only God, gods that are very wise and morally and uh, intellectually superior to human beings. So with, for example, ancient Greek gods, it was pretty obvious that their gods were morally and intellectually not exactly superior to human <laughs> beings. <laughs> yeah? so, so these were gods that were imagined to be a bit like a television public. No? So the Greeks had to do a lot of effort in order for, to, for the stupid public not to get bored. They had to celebrate Olympic Games, sports, song contests, yeah, so that their gods would be in a good mood and not throw lightnings upon them or something just out of boredom. Yeah. Um, so many scholars of 19th century have asked themselves, astonished, did the Greeks really believe in their gods? And of course you cannot say that you can believe in such a god that is intellectually inferior to you and morally inferior. They also had drunk gods, for example, incredible. Uh, so uh, I think what this tells in a way is that we can describe a cultural history where people um, feel observed from very different directions. If we translate mythology into psychoanalysis, we could say that the gods also represented psychic agencies of observations. And when people have very young and silly gods, they feel observed like from below. And they have to present a certain appearance for lower gods. If they have older gods, they feel observed from above and they have to match criteria that uh, are announced by intellectually and morally superior beings. And what this changes is, I think, uh, the degree to which people are ready to accept <coughs> foolish action. So Friedrich Nietzsche has nice remarks about this problem where he said, when the Greeks did something foolish, it was not the human being's fault. They always had some silly <coughs> gods by whom they could excuse themselves. And I think this is very important to remember. And I think this is also a political point uh, that we should keep in mind that we are more and more inclined to accept kind of profane gods like health, sustainability and other superior gods that are morally and intellectually above ourselves. But we are less and less inclined to accept morally inferior gods that uh, uh, would somehow seduce us to have fun, to party and, and so on. Uh, and that means not only that we are less and less reconciled with our pleasures, we are less and less able to celebrate drives <laughs> and, and ambivalent matters because we don't have any gods for that. But also we are not able to experience foolish matters at, as duties. We do not regard lower instances of observation as instances of observation that announce norms and duties. We only think that from below only drives can come. This is the problem, I think, with Freud's notion of the it, which I suggest to, to replace by a notion like the under-ego, uh, a concept of an agency that would announce norms. So that even when some people do some silly things like drinking alcohol, we could say, OK, but they are not stupid. They follow a certain command by a silly god. The whole book Praise of Folly by Erasmus, I think, deals precisely about these problems. That there are follies that are duties and we should respect those duties and praise them. And to finish this, I think I would like at add one um, remark that leads that back to politics. I think at the very moment when pleasures become suspect and when pleasures only appear as filthy, uh, a second instance immediately also arrives, which is the thief of enjoyment. When our enjoyment is unbearable for us, there always seems to be an agent that has stolen the enjoyment from us. In Freud's theory, it is primordial father, but also, interestingly, the double ganger. This is also a thief of enjoyment. At the very moment when pleasure is not just pleasure, but a kind of unbearably big happiness that you cannot accept, there is some kind of double that takes it away from you and that makes you very aggressive and uh, uh, un unable to deal with this uh, 
competitor that you can only kill or he kills you. And I think this is somehow telling about what neoliberalism has somehow made out of us. When we are not anymore interpolated to accept social injunctions as social commands, even to do foolish things, uh, if we are always only interpolated to do very reasonable things, which are not so reasonable as at all, uh, then uh, pleasure becomes filthy and then some thieves of enjoyment arise on the scene uh, against whom we can only be aggressive. And to conclude with one example, um, David Foster Wallace in his wonderful uh, talk, This is Water, has given this nice example of uh, this uh, change of perspective. He says, uh, when I drive with my car and all of a sudden a very fast driver takes over and then uh, uh, cuts into my track, uh, into my lane, I become very aggressive and want to shoot him on the moon. Uh, But this is due to the fact that I have already established a certain imagination. It's my imagination that makes me so aggressive, not the actual behavior of the other. My imagination is that I have to follow rules, but the other doesn't bother about rules. The other just drives as he wants. Psychoanalytically, I am castrated, the other is not. I have to follow rules, the other is urfather, primordial father on four wheels, so to say. But uh, Foster Wallace says, what if I just change this perspective a little bit, if I change the imagination a little bit and construct a different story by saying maybe there is a wounded child on the back seat and the other has to bring this child immediately to some hospital as fast as possible. If I imagine that, then I'm not angry at all anymore. But I may be even happy if I can help the other to find his way the fastest possible. So at the very moment where I imagine that the other is under the command of a duty, I get completely reconciled with the pleasure of the other, the alleged pleasure of the other, and then I totally grant the other his pleasure. So this perception of necessity is actually what makes us social. And so I would say, It is telling that neoliberalism has shaped subjects in a way uh, that says rely upon your own feelings, only accept what you feel fine with and don't accept anything else. And at that point, people uh, become totally asocial. Uh, they, are, they find that any social injunction to enjoy is a kind of alienation that is unbearable to them and a threat to their freedom. And at that moment, uh, they are not anymore able to reconcile themselves with pleasure. And that, I think, is the double loss that neoliberal politics and postmodernity as its ideological supplement have produced. People have been deprived of their ability to experience pleasure as pleasure and not as filthy. And they have become antisocial and they envy the other as a double ganger or as a thief of enjoyment. And I think this is the ide ideological predicament that we find ourselves at the moment in. Thank you for your long attention. Uh, Robert, thank you very much. I have uh, very many questions for you. But just before we go to questions, I wanted to just remind everyone that these books are actually uh, on the shelves right now. So after the talk, after the questions, you can easily obey and either a duty from a silly god or a duty from a neoliberal god, whichever, which is to buy and then really or not. Uh, so choose your god and get buy the book, I guess. Um, and the author would perhaps even be uh, you know, uh, willing to sign those Absolutely. books, which is a fantastic uh, opportunity. So questions now. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, this was quite wonderful. Uh, you took it from basically from uh, your thoughts on interpassivity through your later works uh, to your uh, <coughs> contemporary work, uh, which I thought was really, really exciting. Now, um, I know that you are Altisera, uh, Altisera scholar, um, and so my question would be th this. 
Uh, you, you know how in uh, Althusser talks about uh, this Pascal's formula in mm -hmm. one of his very famous texts. He says mm -hmm. that uh, you know to believe it is not uh, you know your subjective belief, your thoughts in your uh, your ideas in your mind uh, versus your actions in the world. No, it's actually just the actions in the world. It's um, uh, kneel down, move your lips in prayer, and you believe. And so my question is this: I mean, uh, how does this does this relate to uh, interpassivity in any sense? Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that um, you know, because you mentioned this idea of rituals, uh, uh, rituals that are interpassive, basically. Mm -hmm. But this, in Althusser's version, is clearly not that. In, in a way, it's anti-interpassive, uh, I, I would argue. Uh, it's uh, a ritual that is supposed to not only explain the uh, religion, but also, uh, well, somehow at least make the appearance of, uh, of some sort of uh, insight, of some sort of ideas uh, which are beyond simply the, the ritual. So I'm simply mm -hmm. wondering if this, mm -hmm. is, if this fits or doesn't fit with the uh, interpassivity concept mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, of delegated uh, uh, enjoyment. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I admit that I read Pascal here a little differently from the Ljubljana school. Okay. Um, <laughs> but um, to, to be very basic, um, I can show how it would fit into my model. I think uh, here you can very well apply Max Weber's idea of the disenchantment of the world. Yeah? Uh, and the point in Max Weber, which German scholars significantly often misunderstand, the point in Max Weber is that disenchantment of the world, abandoning of all rituals, abandoning of all the glamour of politeness and, and elegance and so on, that this uh, is, according to Max Weber, uh, the result of a kind of religious fanatism, fanaticism. It is not the result of enlightenment. It's not uh, 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 made by science or philosophy's progress. So what we encounter here is a, a step of internalization that abandons a lot of the material culture that was connected to religion or to courtly life, the splendor of, of the aristocracy, whatever. So to put this into my more psychoanalytic uh, view, I would say uh, either you display something for others or you uh, display it more or less for yourself, for your inner observation. And this is what happened with uh, religious rituals in the history of Christianity. Uh, in the beginning, Christians were more pagan. And they displayed a lot, but they didn't ask themselves if they believed what they showed and displayed. Later on, when they started asking themselves, do I really believe, so on, then they became able or keen to abandon ritual. So the, the funny point about religious history is not that people produced such big cathedrals because they believed so much in God. No, uh, they produced cathedrals in order not to have to believe so much in God. They were their interpassive devices. And only when people started to ask themselves, do I really believe in God? They stopped uh, uh, going to church and, and constructing big cathedrals and engaging artists for lovely uh, artworks in, in the church and so on. So uh, I think uh, here you can take uh, uh, what uh, Miran Bozovic here has uh, nicely elaborated in, in his essay, The God of the Trans with diets. Uh, this enlightenment uh, uh, um, or this internalization that we often read as enlightenment consisted in asking yourself, do I really believe? And that relieved people from displaying signs of belief uh, that would have replaced a strong inner belief. And the suspicion against ritual that we can very often observe in religion, this funny hostility of many religions against its own rituals uh, stems from precisely this suspicion that rituals just replace strong inner belief. So to put it into my God model, I would say in the ancient world, things had to be displayed because the gods believed in the people. 
<laughs> when people were celebrating Olympic Games, the gods had the impression, oh, they are funny people, they are in a good mood, that's how we like them. Uh, people did not ask themselves, do I believe? At the moment that people start asking themselves these questions, they start abandoning rituals. Then they start believing in something and that allows them to uh, abandon rituals. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, open floor. Um, if someone has a question, let's follow the ritual of raising the hand and <laughs> and letting somebody else ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to ask a question instead of you. I, I have a few more. So, I'll, you know, I will ask questions if you want. So. <laughs> Just speak um, up. You, I think that all the things in our homes belong to this uh, interfacility mm -hmm. phenomena. Uh -huh. And we have this drive to get rid of these things. So we probably want to get rid of interfacility method that we already achieved and learned and the whole society is built on this interpassivity because we go and buy clothes even if we don't need them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where do you see the resolution of this? Uh, because this is really driving the whole society mad I think because because of this they start uh, with this um, searching for better gods, or how do I say, for this sustainability and things, you know, for these smart things mm -hmm. that excuse your interpacific action. Mm -hmm. So, where do you see the the future? Where is the future going? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, um, as you may have seen, I have a certain sympathy for interpassive behavior. And I think that consumerism does not find necessarily its strongest support in interpassive attitudes. I think uh, the other ones that are more internalized ethical fashion. So they, they are even the stronger triggers. That's why um, merchandising uh, shifted to those strategies. Uh, if, if you just buy the clothes that you don't wear, at some point your drawers are filled and then uh, it's, uh, it's over. But, if, <laughs> it, it, uh, but with sustainable uh, fashion and you have to buy even more sustainable things and, and if you have a, a, a car that doesn't consume much fuel but then you buy a car, an electric car because it's even more sustainable and so I think there you can, uh, uh, that's a, in a kind uh, of enlarged uh, chain of consumption, uh, spiral of consumption. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you feel that? Uh, I, may I intervene yeah, and just please. add mm. to this question because this was uh, the line of the, the way of uh, in the way that I also wanted to ask. So I get to ask another mm -hmm. question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you mentioned this duty to celebrate, but of course you don't mention much the duty to enjoy Coca-Cola, for instance. I mean, mm -hmm. Coca-Cola clearly plays on this. Mm -hmm. uh, what you would perhaps describe as interpassive behavior uh, or as a, uh, a duty from the lower god. I mean, a lot of advertisements are basically a duty from lower gods. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. advertisers claim this outright. Sex sells, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, this is how they sell. They promote sex, sexuality. Express yourself, be yourself, whatever. Mm -hmm. So there is, I mean, I understand what you are saying completely, and I, I even agree with this idea of, uh, yes, but sustainability is another drive to produce and buy. But, I mean, there is also the drive, I mean, there's the old fashion, let's call it, like the modernist, uh, the modernist uh, consumer would be the consumer like James Bond, mm -hmm. who drink, who would, uh, you know, buy clothes and cars and whatever. 
Right, yes. Yes, I agree with you. But again, I would claim that uh, enjoy Coca-Cola is in a way old-fashioned. No? Enjoy something sustainable, something healthy, something that saves the planet uh, is, is a much stronger injunction yeah? that, that catches people much more. And I would claim also sex does not sell best today. What sells much better is hostility against sex. Yeah? So if, if you can, uh, a story about sex in a newspaper does not sell, but a story about sexual harassment, that, that sells. No? So uh, again, people uh, can only allow themselves to be interested in sexual <coughs> matters under the condition that there's a duty connected uh, with them, which is a duty of hostility and ascetism. OK, thank you. Someone raised their hand, I think. I really have more questions. <laughs> you sound like a threat. This is not a problem for me. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to be. You know. uh, so mm -hmm. please go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, yeah. Yes. Let me follow up on, the, um, on what you've been talking about, um, and what I'm perhaps not understanding very well is you said that. Um, Having our ability for enjoyment blocked is sort of making us antisocial. Yes. But you've also talked about certain of those blockers of, of our ability of enjoyment. Yes. Um, and among them were things that were clearly drives that are, or, or tendencies that are, or injunctions that are ethical in nature, or social in nature, so to speak, like the concern for. Um, Sustainability um, is one that comes to mind, for instance. Mm -hmm. so, um, so how does it make us antisocial? This is, this is something that I'm understanding or following. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I, I would say, OK, if you mm, allow yourselves only to uh, buy fancy clothes, if you get the assurance that this is also sustainable and this saves the planet, uh, then you replace the social injunction to be fashionable, to be a la mode, to, to be so sociable. Uh, you replace this injunction by a kind of higher internalized, slightly aggressive injunction, yeah? because the others are not as sustainable as you. Uh, there's a certain, obje certain objection, a certain criticism or already involved in the sustainable dressing that you may display tomorrow. Uh, so I think uh, the, the silly pleasure of just being fashionable is due to a social injunction, and it becomes possible due to a social injunction. When it becomes impossible because sociability is being destroyed, then it has to be replaced by a kind of internalized duty. Then you have a higher god named sustainability to which you alone pray. You do not need a community for that. Yeah. Yeah. So you basically do not believe that um, if you buy sustainable clothes, this will somehow save our planet. <laughs> this, this is how I understand yes. what you're saying. Yeah. Do not believe that sustainable clothing will save our planet. Well, I think this was one of the, 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 the e most evil tricks of, of uh, postmodern capitalism to invent this critical consumer no? and, and to, to tell consumers that by consuming in a certain way they could change the world. No, I mean, sorry folks, but uh, a little more is required for that. You, ha you, you, yeah, uh, you cannot uh, regulate the financial markets by just the way how you buy your trousers or your shirts. Yeah? Uh, you need political power in order to, to, to do the most uh, important uh, things. And, uh, and also the struggle for, for ecology is an eminently political struggle. It's not that you can convince people that our planet is in danger. The ruling forces of this planet have understood that very well. Well, and they are fighting for the fact that we all die before they run out of oil and water. <laughs> and also, again, you cannot solve that problem just by the way how you dress or how you eat, but you must fight and uh, overpower those powers. That's quite impressive. Thank you. Um, 
Questions? If not, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Robert. It's great as usual. And um, well, actually, I think it's something that keeps coming back in with some of these questions, and that is also kind of nagging me, and I will try to formulate it, but because there is something about this distinction between the ancient times and now, and what is being silly and, and not, that kind of very much depends, you know, on where you stand. For instance, you can say, and this is clearly how it came across when you described it, that somebody who cannot enjoy his shoes or her shoes, uh, if it, another shoe is not sent to Africa, this looks to me like a silly pleasure at its purest. Mm -hmm. a completely silly pleasure. It's a kind of a ritual. A kind of, I can imagine some kind of anthropological gaze from far away, which would look to our society, like from above, and think, mm -hmm. what silly people they were believing in this kind of silly god, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. sending shoes to Africa so that they could enjoy their own shoes. Mm -hmm. So and I'm not so sure that I see this huge difference. And also what you just said in relationship to these small things that we, uh, I mean, consumerism that actually convinces us that we do something good in order precisely to be able to enjoy. But if we really wanted to change the world, something much more would be needed. So, and this is the greater God that would say, OK, <laughs> I mean, the, uh -huh. with pleasure, that there is always this thing that I think, as you said yourself, there is this ambiguity, which is always there. No pleasure is just. Uh, single pleasure. So you need some kind of obstacle, negativity, duty, whatever, big or small, in order to turn this um, base thing into the sublime thing. So be it this shoe that you sent to Africa, it works in a similar way, then it friends fall upon you and say, okay, now it's your duty to go out with us. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that you're mm -hmm. making the difference, but I have the impression that it's a kind of slippery because mm -hmm. at the end the question is, do you what is actually this pleasure enjoyment because you can can you get rid of it even if it's a duty is it not that precisely in all these silly stupid things uh, whatever sustainable or shoe scent uh, across the world uh, is it's a particularly very perverse or strange way of enjoyment nevertheless absolutely so, so yes if we just mm -hmm. condemn this in this enjoyment mm -hmm. are we not kind of repeating the same gesture of saying, but this mm -hmm. is just silly. Let us really enjoy. Like there is mm -hmm. good enjoyment, and then there is this mm -hmm. enjoyment. And, okay. it, and it's kind of slippery. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, see, I see your point. Well, uh, for the last part of your question, I would uh, use Freud's notion of neurotic displeasure. No? I mean, you can uh, put Freud's position maybe into the line that uh, pleasure is always there but not always in its pleasant form. Mm -hmm. no? Neurotics have a lot of sex, but in the form of neurotic symptoms under which they suffer. Yeah? So, so sex is always there, but either in a form that is pleasant for the people, more or less, or it's definitely unpleasant and they suffer. And um, I think, in a way, uh, this is our constant problem at the moment. No? Uh, uh, you know, in the universities that I knew, for example, in the 70s and 1980s, uh, a lot of waste was produced. We had a lot of uh, uh, wasted seminars where people uttered stupid ideas, a lot of detours were being made, but it was a kind of pleasant waste. Yeah? I, I wouldn't want to miss any of these hours where, where some crazy colleagues uttered some crazy ideas and we uh, seriously discussed them. Uh, uh, the way how university wastes today is bureaucracy, where you have to report all the time 70% of the student at attention is being consumed by uh, which seminars they have to book first into uh, before they have to do other seminars and like that. And this is, I would say, neurotic waste. It's not pleasant for anybody. It's, it's even more waste, but uh, not pleasant for anybody. And uh, thank you for the, uh, for the remark about the, the silliness of, of the gods. I totally agree with you. Of course, it's totally silly to think that Africa will be saved by our second shoes. And, uh, uh, but uh, again, psychoanalytically, I would make a difference here. A very silly person uh, 
like the average American that is addressed with this shoe trick, uh, a very silly person will, of course, have also a very silly god. But still, it makes a difference if the silly person uh, settles or situates that god below himself or above himself. And, and this god is still, by a very silly person, situated above the silly person. The silly person has a duty to which it looks up. Oh, I am saving Africa with my shoes. Yeah? Uh, this is, uh, fills the person with self-respect and the sense of duty and a kind of egocentonic identification with the duty. Whereas a silly duty, like those described by Erasmus, uh, always even silly persons are filled with the feeling that these are silly duties. Uh, so silly, but I have to go to that party today. Uh, uh, parents sigh, so silly, it's Christmas. Children sigh, so silly, it's Christmas, but we do it for the parents. So, so um, uh, silly duties uh, are situated structurally or topically, uh, topologically below the ego. And, and that's, I think, the crucial difference that also accounts for is it uh, pleasure or does it, get, does it become neurotic pleasure? So they have silly upper gods, but still they are upper. And that makes the pleasure that is still there neurotic. Mm. So it's the kind of, if you kind of see that it's silly and you still do it, this would be the, that, that you are able to say, OK, this is silly, but this is no reason for me to not do in this sense. But uh, uh, you recognize the silliness but uh, if you recognize the silliness, then you have a lower god, and yeah, and, and, and you obey it as a duty. But if it's silly and still you situ you would situate it above yourself, it's a, it's a, it's a duty. Uh, um, then uh, it, it is for us a silly god, but for the person <laughs> it was, would be a, uh, a respected god. Um, thank you. This sounds. Oh, we have more questions. I, I was just wondering um, uh, about the role, let's say, of artists. Mm, I imagine that in previous times there was this uh, festivity in the sense that artists would enjoy and be lazy for the others. No? For mm -hmm. the, yeah. Uh, and now it seems as because we are so hyper productive. Artist society does not have, cannot uh, uh, rely upon us being lazy for them. Yes, no? right. Yes. Or not doing. <laughs> so I'm wondering, I'm wondering that we are really not doing us favor because we produce so much. Because then, I, I don't know. Because I feel in all the people around who are not dealing with arts, they are secretly wishing that I would not do much. You know, yeah. They're always saying, but you guys, you're lazy, you don't do so much, you enjoy. And I'm like, no, we produce so much. And they, I feel that they are disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering, what's your take on that? Thank you very much. Yeah. I think also the role of the artist as an interpassive <laughs> medium for society has shifted considerably. Yeah? I think what you describe is the classical modern artist, yeah? late 19th century, early 20th century, certainly very lazy artist. Yeah? Just imagine the work of Marcel Duchamp. Yeah? I mean, <laughs> no art student would, would finish an art art study today, an art diploma with that body of work. Yeah? And that's a lifelong body of work. Yeah? Yeah? But you would not end up like three semesters with, <laughs> with, with that body of work, maybe. Yeah? <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I think here in postmodernity also this has shifted. The artist is not any more lazy for us and, and enjoying on our behalf. I, I have the suspicion the artist is today good on our behalf. The artists are incredibly good, at least those at the documenta and, and so on. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? Yeah? They, they, are all, they all have some serious concern about some problem or some minority. And they say, oh, yes, there's even another minority of which I did not think before. It's true. <laughs> and and, no? <laughs> and uh, so I think uh, they are, uh, again, uh, like uh, they, they interpassively deal with our morality. 
just as now this Friday for future children interpassively deal with our ecological consciousness. No? They, uh, they are ecological on our behalf and we let them say things that we say to ourselves and then we can say yes the children are so right and, and so yeah so uh, also this can be acted out in an interpassive way but uh, again I think the the nature of this interpassivity changes and uh, at the very moment when the artists become good in our place uh, then I think uh, we enjoy in a neurotic way. So when you go home from, an, from a documenta exhibition and you are deeply concerned about the sorrows of the world and even half an hour later you are very deeply concerned and one hour later you have forgotten about everything and, and uh, I think this is a kind of neurotic displeasure that we indulge in when we like artists to be so serious and, and, and to, to catch us with their seriousness. I think then we enjoy as Alenka has pointed out, but without enjoying in a pleasant way. But also, if I may mm -hmm. insist, I really like the point that you made uh, in the middle of the paper precisely about this kind of spontaneous philosophy of artists that kind of dumps mm -hmm. uh, the real thought mm -hmm. that is already there in the, in the work itself. And I think this is part of this dialectic that all these documenta and some other things are so much um, swallowed already or embedded in some mm -hmm. kind of uh, philosophical, theoretical, moral, whatever discourse and which uh, from which they mostly uh, get their value. I mean also this is usually the way people are selected for such uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. So that they, that there is this game precisely if you want you, uh, it's kind of also explicitly the, the, the one chosen are the one that already in a kind of pre-established moral, whatever, spontaneous uh, view, are the ones who are good for us and will do this good work for us instead of us and so on. Exactly. There is yes. no uh, this kind of element, let's say, of surprise. Exactly. They are in kind of uh, artistic shows, precisely you don't know what to expect and it could be something very bad, but this is yeah, what usually makes you think, not that you are just kind of reassured that yeah, we will so it's, it's related, I think, the, the, the two questions. And yes. It's a very important point. Yes. And it's not only in art, it's like even philosophy is often kind of indulged in, in its own spontaneous <laughs> philosophy to some extent. <laughs> so I think yes. uh, the, the, the whole question yeah, of uh, how to intervene in this, and that is precisely not by being good and by uh, kind of in advance trying to comply with all the ideals, because this is, again, the, the, it's more even the question of yeah, you are totally right. I totally agree with you. And I think uh, all the research politics uh, somehow reinforce this development. Because if researchers have to tell in advance what they will research, the results will be very poor and very little surprising. You know? I, I would advocate for a system that would not uh, uh, force them to tell in advance, but to tell after the fact. Uh, you, you submit your last work and say, I want to do a next work. And they say, yeah, your last work is brilliant. Yeah, so you get some grant for your next work and do whatever you want. I think that would function much better in the sciences and in the arts. Um, and especially in the arts, I think uh, the problem you describe is, is terrible, that we see a lot of artworks that are totally subjected to the spontaneous philosophy of the artists and the curators. And artists speaking the language of the curators and subjecting their own production to that discourse. And I think the telling symptom of that is uh, if you go to a documenta and you ask yourself how many of these works uh, contained any element that made a difference between seeing the artwork in place or reading about the artwork in Kunstforum or somewhere else. And most of these artworks make no difference whatsoever. You say, ah, that's a refugee's boat, okay, yes. And this is a column with books, yes, okay, yes. And it's only a column with books and you don't see anything else about it. And you just see the refugee boat and nothing else about it. But somebody could have said refugee boat and you would say, yeah, sad, so sad story. No? It's a bit, I think, documentary today works a bit like this joke about the crazy people who just uh, tell jokes to each other which they already know by telling the numbers of the jokes 65 yeah <laughs> <laughs> so they know in advance and there is no surprise no joke work anymore going on yeah. okay uh, it is 
Uh, okay, we, we, I will allow one more question uh, and mm -hmm. then we finish. Uh, but I simply wanted to say that. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> okay, the people demand more. So I'm going to shut up and. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe a silly question. Um, when you were talking about the epochs, and young gods and old gods, uh, what about on the um, in the individual itself? When is a person, when does a person tend to be interpassive? So children, are they able mm -hmm. of interpassivity or teenagers? And you mentioned Fridays for Future. Is that uh, mm -hmm. activity? And then there is a point like a mirror stage and the interpassivity stage from where mm -hmm. people tend to, 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 mm -hmm. to be interpassive or... Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well. Uh, you, it's not at all silly and it's a complicated problem. Uh, and um, I think Freud would have answered that in order for interpassivity to happen, one has to overcome narcissism. And only then it could happen. Before, when we believe that uh, wishing is the same as making things true, omnipotence of thought or so, uh, also, interpassivity would not uh, be possible. But one thing that always makes me doubt here, uh, which I find interesting, is that uh, as Johann Heusinger in his book uh, Homo Ludens remarks, also children, not the smallest children, but very small children, all, already they know that they play when they play. And he quotes this nice example of a father coming home and the little son has uh, established a chain of chairs and it's a train and he is the first chair or sits on the first chair and he himself is the locomotive. And then the father is somehow charmed by this little game and kisses the son and then the son says, father you must not kiss the locomotive because otherwise the wagons believe it's not true. <laughs> 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 and here you have a very early example of interpassivity. It's not him who believes it's a train. He fools the cars of the train. <laughs> I know there are... Uh, Janis, is, is, uh, Janis has a question oh in, the, in, the, in the dark background. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know, can you think about two things? Uh, um, that you somehow mentioned. So one is this uh, blinding on yourself when you borrow <coughs> uh, the knowledge from somewhere. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, this, I would like to ask you this in connection with uh, you put kind of interpassivity as a kind of counter, uh, counter point towards interactivity. And I'm thinking maybe did you ever problematize this question of inter? Now, if, there is, if the problem is that you are actually blinding yourself, your produced, inherent produced philosophy by borrowing uh, <laughs> from somewhere else, uh, did you ever think about that the problem in interactivity or interpassivity might actually be inter and not the, 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 the opposition between the two? Uh -huh. I'm asking this question from what you were saying about blinding yourself by borrowing. I have also a continuation of this question, but maybe. Ah, <laughs> maybe I can understand the first part better if I hear the second part. <laughs> I have a, uh, OK, uh, I, 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 I'm also wondering, yeah, uh, do you by somehow, um, OK, this is a very naive question. Then, I, I will ask you, yeah. do you somehow accept uh, some kind of disciplinization of knowledge by actually uh, yeah, problematizing that you actually blind yourself by borrowing uh, you know, <coughs> uh, uh, philosophy from somewhere else and not staying with incorrect? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I must say, these are my questions. But I agree very much with what you are saying. <laughs> I agree with this artist, uh, 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 you know, trying to explain and then actually uh, 
mm -hmm. troubles. But I would like actually to uh, ask you about this interdimension. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> well, in the first place, I would say um, the notion of inter is not the same in interactivity as in interpassivity. Uh, I think uh, the inter in interactivity is quite a silly inter in a way. It, uh, very few artworks have been enhanced by the contribution of the observers, actually. Uh, in, the, in the best case, the artists have somehow used the observers as their puppets or as their marionettes. It's not, uh, again, it, it, it does not even match its own description in what it is, and especially not in the best cases. Uh, whereas in, in interpassivity, uh, I think um, you can speak about the fact that people delegate their enjoyment to, to something else, to some other agents or to some machines, and they sometimes even want that to take place. So a real transfer is, is taking place, and, and that is an inter. Um, and again, I, I cannot quite connect it to what you pointed at with this blinding dimension. Uh, Actually, I, I think I might, I might have yeah, not. Please, yeah. Which is, which is, <laughs> this is ridiculous, yeah. of course. This is completely wrong. But I think uh, one should go back to Althusser. Mm -hmm. Because you were talking about Althusser and Althusser's notion of uh, spontaneous uh, philosophy of the scientist. And you were simply saying that you can easily apply that to spontaneous uh, philosophy of the artist. It's as simple as that. And I think in Althusser, to make things again sort of schematic, you could simply say that is just the predominant ideology. Mm -hmm. so what, uh, what the artist uh, spontaneously philosophizes about their own work is just the contemporary predominant ideology. It's basically you know, the mm -hmm. buzzwords that are heard and used by, by, by the policymakers. I'm using a buzzword. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, but, but, what, but, but what Robert was talking about, the, the concept at the level of their work, this is not something that they have meditated in a conceptual way as a philosophers. This is something that is present in their work. Uh, I'm thinking of a French word, "asson misu." It was kind of produced. Um, you know, they were not. Uh, they were not in pos the possession of the conceptual knowledge uh, that was nevertheless uh, inside their work. I hope. Uh, yes, yes, I. <laughs> this was Robert. <laughs> my, my pleasure, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah, but I don't know if you feel satisfied with, uh, with the brilliant answer that <laughs> Gregor has given on my behalf. Yeah. Um, yes, but I would like. Uh, I don't know. Let's talk later. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think there is some problem with this inter, yeah? And actually, you brought it up. Mm -hmm. This inter and inter in activity and passivity. And mm -hmm. maybe this inter doesn't go so much out because we think about the relation and so on. Maybe it's something internal. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Maybe this inter actually, but. Forget. It. Okay. Uh -huh. Should uh -huh. we take more questions? Uh -huh. People were claiming that they have more questions, so it's now time to shoot them. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, Katya. Yeah, I wanted to return to the fascinating line of discussion about the role of the artist and the role of the artist switching from being lazy for us to being yeah. for Actually, there's another wrinkle to this, and it's the public, the perception in the general public that I've noticed here in Slovenia, at least but probably elsewhere as well, that artists are actually perceived as being lazy. Really? As well. uh, Slovenia seems to be still a <laughs> lucky country. <laughs> <It's yours. laughs> In the sense that we don't do anything serious. So uh -huh. There's this perception of laziness, but also a hostility to this laziness. So, so how would that fit in with the In saying? the general discourse, I think, yeah. uh, is what Katya is discussing, the general mm -hmm. political the general discourse, mm -hmm. and not actually people who know any artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that just this perception from, from the outside, so to speak. Uh -huh. Okay. Society, but, but I think it's very prevalent. So 
Yes. Yes. Well, I, I'm not so sure. Uh, I can only say how maybe in Austria such a discussion would run. Maybe Austria, I admit, is a very different country. But still, uh, I think we could maybe, um, the people from the cultural field could maybe convince the conservatives and even the extreme right that uh, the, the artists are working like poor devils. And uh, I think we have prepared this propaganda already by introducing the notion of the cultural worker. No? And since the 1990s, we were not educating artists anymore at the academies, but cultural workers. No? So it was serious work. They would maybe admit that and they say, OK, it's true. You also work like crazy. You also have to apply for funds. And it's as, as boring as science or other business. But they would insist what you produce like crazy is something that we don't need. So you are not lazy in the sense that you sleep all the time, but uh, you are lazy in the sense that you produce something that does not match any any demand. No? So so it's so it's waste and, and superfluous ornament, something like that. No? So in this sense, they would uh, be hostile against it. I think. It's actually very similar to Slovenia. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so it is yeah. Victory Day. Um, there are very many celebrations that we are supposed to celebrate tonight. I mean, I know there are, f for many people I know they have to go to very many parties after this. <laughs> so unless there is, you know, another serious <laughs> God and immense <laughs> beauty of <laughs> asking serious questions, oh. Let them speak now or <laughs> forever. <laughs> um, if not, let me finish here and and uh, remind you once again that there is the opportunity to buy this book, Interpassionos, uh, at a special discount price tonight with uh, the author's signature. So go ahead and do it. And again, thank you, Robert. Thank you very much, Gregor. Thank you. <laughs>